Good afternoon, photo lovers. You are listening to I Love Photography Live. If you're in the Northeast, man, we feel sorry for you. That blanket of cold air. It's so cold, the New York Times is reporting uh, owls from the Arctic have settled in New York <laughs> and Grand Central. At any rate, you might be watching us on youtube.com slash photoshelter, or you might be listening to the podcast by going to iTunes and searching for I Love Photography. Joining me uh, again uh, this week is my lovely co-host, Sarah Jacobs. How are you? Hey, Alan. I'm doing okay. How are you? Uh, you are fighting a little bit of a cold. I am. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just getting over the tail end of a cold. It's, it seems to be cold season. It definitely is. If you, as you were saying, if you haven't had a cold in the past two months, you're like invincible somehow. So invincible, yeah. I mean, get with the program. <laughs> yeah. Come on, share, share some of the love, share some of the germs. Exactly. I got the flu shot, but I didn't get a flu. I just got a normal cold, and it's still kind of a bummer. Mm. Uh, as usual, I think we're talking about photography today. You know, the one thing that I wanted to talk to you about because uh, you weren't on the show last week is this whole world press photo thing. And I know you love to talk about this kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay, why don't I talk about it some more? Do. Here's, here's my impression. Uh, because, you know, they came out and they said 20% of the penultimate round was rejected. That's right. Which is just a huge number of photos. Melissa Little, who is on the NPPA board, the National Press Photographers Association board, she had a thread on Facebook about it. And she got an... Uh, uh, a submission from a photographer who said he was rejected in that round uh, by World Press. And he sent Melissa the original raw file and the uh, image, the processed image that he entered. And he said, I don't understand what the issue is. And Melissa looked at it and she says, I don't really understand what the issue is. Uh oh. So it, it goes back to what I was saying last week, which is there's a huge divide between what is understood on paper, which is, of course, excessive toning is not good, and the reality of that situation. And what would be a real shame is for um, these award winners to come out, as they did in the past week, and a few pundits like myself to come out and say, well, we've got we to gotta do something to clarify this, and then have the conversation stop and make it go away until next year. World Press has said they're going to give visual guidance, which I think is important, but beyond that, I really would call upon the people who were disqualified to show their images, the RAWs and the process files, in order that we can continue to have a discussion about it because it affects the credibility of the contests. Not just World Press, but all the contests that can't articulate why an image gets DQ'd. And it kind of reminds me of the Olympics. Um, when you're looking at like gymnastics or you know something something where there is a subjective component to the judging, and you watch it and you're like, wow, that was amazing, and then one judge from some better, <laughs> somewhere you know gives it like a four or something, you're like, what? That's crazy. Um, and because there's no transparency in the judging, that you have no idea what the logic is behind that. Now the Olympic. Olympic committees and some of these big competition committees have, have gone in and said, okay, we're going to reject the best score and the worst score as a way to sort of temper the outliers. But that's sort of in response to people saying, what's the, what's the big deal? Like, wh why would we even bother watching this and care about who, who wins or not when it's so clearly rigged? You know, that's sort of the conspiracy theory. Right. Well, it being kept secret, I mean, that that idea seems pretty antiquated. Why can't World Press just let out all the photos that were disqualified? I'm glad that to hear that the photographers were actually warned, yes. hey, your photo was disqualified. We think it was too heavily manipulated to yeah. be considered. Well, I think the worst thing World Press could do is be defensive about the discussion. Yeah. Say, we're, no, we're leaders and we're going to continue to strive, but, but then not be able to sort of head on say, okay, this is the reason why we thought it was wrong and then have a discussion around that and then be able to say, okay, we might have been wrong about this one and, and here's why. You, you got to have the conversation continue because it is a subjective thing. And the fact that we're so out of alignment between what the jury and the forensics experts thinks are, are acceptable and the photographers think are acceptable and not even all photographers are on the same plane as you can imagine. Oh yeah, right. Uh, that okay. the, the conversation has to has to continue. 
Okay, yeah. enough about that. <laughs> well, we'll continue the conversation then, Alan. We'll check in about it every other week or Let's so. Let's check in about it. Yeah. We'll continue the conversation. This Sunday is Oscar weekends. Speaking about another competition that I don't care about. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care about award shows. I, you know, all the movies that I want to see are mostly because the critics say these were the really good movies this year. Go see them. Not because it won. Mm -hmm. Like, who cares about Picture of the Year? Okay, whatever. Uh, one of those movies that's probably not going to win is Selma. Um, but we're not talking about the movie Selma. We're talking about the actual March to Selma and the event known as Bloody Sunday when a lot of black marchers were beaten down by police. Um, and on the scene was the photographer Spider Martin. Um, Spider, James Spider Martin, is a white photographer who was covering a lot of that stuff, but he was one of the few people that actually covered the, uh, the violence that occurred on that day. And the entire week from start... Yeah. To finish, and I, I found that really interesting. It's because he shot for the Birmingham News, so he shot for a local newspaper. So he just happened to be there, and he didn't have to travel, you know, like the AP Press did after the events had already occurred or started, you know, started occurring. Um, which reminded me a lot of remember when you and I interviewed David Carson, who yes. had, who yeah, who shot down in Ferguson. He was able to get, you know, right from the beginning, that very first. And I feel like it just it's so important these little photojournalists that I mean these photojournalists that are in these little towns, you know. Yeah, the value of having a local press that knows the territory, knows the people, knows what's going on. Exactly. Um, you know, that and and we mentioned this before, that's sort of the tragedy of of um, the newspaper world and the and the um, the aggregation um, of of all of these entities with Gannett and et cetera. It's like the local coverage suffers tremendously as a result of it. Exactly, and when important events like this protest, like the Selma protests or, or Ferguson protests, begin to happen, we need those people on the ground immediately so that we know the story from start to finish. So here's Spider in a tree. <laughs> I love um, it. Five foot two inches. Not a big guy. Not a big guy was able to kind of scurry up the tree. I want to go back to this one image, um, and again, he was there when the violence was occurring. This is a scary. This is a scary image. It looks like freaking Nazi Germany. Yeah. Going on, just you know, SS. Yeah, protesters are just being beaten with batons in this shot. And you know what? Not so dissimilar from other protests that we've seen in the U.S. and around the world. Just yeah, very recently. Yeah, you need you need the press there to 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 cover this stuff. That's um, a really nice piece in the New York Times. Uh, yeah, the the University of I'm I'm really glad the University of Texas in Austin has bought Mr. Martin's archive. Yeah, so. a nice piece of American history, Americana. Yep. All the links that we're talking about today, you will be able to find on our, our blog at blog.photoshelter.com. We talked about Rob Whitworth uh, a few months ago when he came out with what he calls flow motion of Barcelona. <laughs> oh, yes, I remember that. And, it, you know, he took us through, it just, I don't even know how he does it. But it's basically a time lapse, but he's moving through it. So it's more like a hyperlapse. It's not, it's not a stationary camera. And not only that, but he would use uh, telephoto lenses and zoom lenses and get closer and closer to the action and then follow people around the city, etc. He has come out with one of Dubai. Um, and we found this on Petapixel and the, and the high def video is on Vimeo. And I, I just can't even wrap my head around how he conceives of this and then how he actually executes it. So he got all this kind of permission because he was filming from the moment that he got to the airport. And he put a remote camera on a piece of luggage that went through the luggage sorting machine um, and hyperlapsed all this stuff. And again, you know, the, the tallest building in the world is there. So he goes all through Dubai, and it's kind of unbelievable <laughs> how he does this. I don't know how he has the patience to put this stuff together, but you can see all of these um, jimmied-up rigs that he has. And here's one where there's a, you know, a camera attached to a suitcase, uh, and then he goes into a hotel room, and then he's got a, you know, all of these cameras on rigs, and whatnot. It it it's amazing, and I hope this guy's getting a lot of work from, 
tourism bureaus and everybody because this is I mean it makes your city look incredible yeah he's incredible. using a ton of gear I mean if you, you scroll up to that photo of just all the gear he's using I mean yeah. he's got he's got everything on deck <laughs> Yeah, and you know, I don't know how I got that. So they actually show him with a camera mounted in the cockpit of this plane. <laughs> I thought I thought you can't do that anymore, but I guess I'm wrong. Good for you, Rob Whitworth. You you definitely need to uh, check that one out. That is that is a beaut. We've talked about uh, the fashion industry. We've talked about. Uh, the pervasiveness of Photoshop. We've seen movements where models say we don't want to be retouched, and we've seen campaigns like Dove, Real Bodies, um, uh, American Eagle with the Airy Real Bodies campaign as well. This came out last week, unaltered Cindy Crawford photos from Marie Claire. And Cindy Crawford, who if you're around my age, you remember Cindy Crawford being one of the kind of original supermodels. Just unbelievably gorgeous and seemed to sort of transcend all celebrity when she was big in like the 80s um, and maybe early 90s. My first reaction when I saw this photo of now 50-something-year-old Cindy Crawford was, ew. <laughs> and... You know what that proved to me was how pervasive Photoshop is. And even if you think you're immune to the effects of Photoshop and the media and your perception of body types, whether it's men or, or women or whatever, like this is actually what people look like. And yet yeah. my first reaction was, ew. Now, granted, most 50-year-olds <laughs> aren't wearing like lingerie and posing. Right. Buttons. Right. It, it's, it's very strange seeing, yeah, seeing the juxtaposition of like, this 50-year-old body in this, like, very sexy, you know, she's posing very sexy, which is totally fine. She can wear whatever she wants, and yeah. she can rock that outfit, but it is a strange, you are like, oh, it's kind of jarring um, to see it. We 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 saw photos of, like, Madonna. We saw those nude photos of Madonna uh, a few weeks ago, um, and, and it's weird because, you know, Madonna takes really, really good care of herself. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it's because she's still a performer. Yeah. So she doesn't. Well, and and plus they probably photoshopped the hell out of those images. Oh, they they. Oh, definitely. <laughs> but but th th this was a good uh, sanity check for me. To one, you know, you have this image of someone from when they were at their peak, and that kind of never goes away. Um. And then, two, the reality is, like, we all get older and we all age and there's nothing you can do about it unless you want to be, like, Bruce Jenner and, like, tighten your face so taut that you look like a, like a doll. <laughs> yeah, um, true. True. Well, and a lot of... It, it was nice to see that on, on social media a lot of people coming to Cindy's support. I mean, yeah, this absolutely. image was totally leaked. She didn't... She wasn't like, oh, release this photo of me unphotoshopped. Um, it was leaked. But a lot of people on, on Twitter and Facebook just showing their support, being like, yeah, this is what bodies look like. Can everyone stop freaking out? I'm proud of, you know, proud of Cindy, blah, blah, blah. So, nice to see that support. Yeah, I freaked out a little bit, but I'm getting over it now. So, you know, I, I think it's good. Yeah, <laughs> it is good. <laughs> uh, uh, as you know, Sarah, I'm from Hawaii. And whenever you see anything about photos in Hawaii, you gotta talk about. I gotta it. bring I it up. I gotta I bring it up. Well, you know, Hawaii is a very picturesque place. Other than the fact that I'm from Hawaii. This was this was actually a pretty interesting shoot um, for for a number of reasons. Um, so you might remember the Endless Summer uh, poster. It's an old movie, Endless Summer poster, pretty iconic in the design and the in the movie world. And uh, so a photographer in Hawaii named Aaron Eveland decided that he wanted to kind of recreate it and, and do it on a spin. Well, we have beautiful sunsets in Hawaii. And currently, because the volcano is really doing its thing, um, when the southerly winds come up uh, from the big island to the other islands, we get what's known as volcanic smog or VOG, which I said, is yeah, a I'd never heard of that. Of yeah, VOG. it's a real thing. It's not we don't make it up. It's actually it's a thing that happens with relative frequency. Oh. 
It causes a lot of people to have allergies and asthma because it's like particulate dust, but it also gives you like incredible sunsets, really orangey sunsets. So Aaron Evelyn says, you know what? I want to recreate this. Um, I'm going to rent a really, really long telephoto lens because I have to do that to make the sun look huge and compress everything together. He did all of this research of like where the sun's going to land. He did a test shoot with a 200 millimeter lens just to like figure it out. One of the people that he shot in this is actually Brooke Dombrowski, who we interviewed for our Instagram uh, guide because Brooke has got you know hundreds of thousands of followers. She's a photographer. Uh, she's a model. She's sort of royalty on the uh, uh, on the North Shore of Oahu. Her dad is like a huge lifeguard uh, out there. Um, but it's it's cool. So he rented this 800 millimeter lens from the Lens Pro to go. The most expensive Canon lens out there, right? Huge lens. Look how big this lens is. <laughs> it's it's massive. So it's a Canon lens, but he attached it to a Sony A7 with a doubler. So he was at 1600 millimeters. Wow. And he ended up getting like these photos, which are kind of insane. But he talks about uh, how much planning went into this. So this is Brooke with her longboard. And I follow Brooke on Instagram, and she said he was actually three beaches away. She had a walkie-talkie <laughs> on her hip so that okay. they could say, move to the left, move to the right. I was wondering how, how he was directing his subjects because yeah. obviously he had to be far away for this. Oh, wow. So, it, you know, I was thinking, it's like, you think you just want to capture a sunset photo. But to make a really good sunset photo a really great sunset photo, there's a lot of planning. Yeah. You've got to know where the sun's going to set. You've got to do your test shots. You've got to make sure you, you can communicate with the model. Um, he said a lot of days, you know, the clouds would roll in right towards the sunset and, he, and it would ruin the shot because you, you can't have clouds if you want to get this sort of fireball effect. Yeah, all of his subjects are just silhouettes against the sun. Yeah. It's really great. And actually, I think the best shot is of your friend, Brooke. Yes, and there's a little movie he made as well, so check that out. And again, also, all the links uh, will be available on the blog. There's something I wanted to ask you. He talks about the green flash of light yes. that happens right as the sun sets. And I have only experienced or seen that once, and it was on a beach. Mm -hmm. But I was very happy to learn that that is a real thing. It's a real thing, the green flash. <laughs> if you're ever, listeners, if you're ever at a beach, watch the sunset till that last second and there's a green flash. It's pretty You kind of, well, it doesn't always happen. You kind of have to have a very, very wide vista. And if I'm remembering correctly, the physical, the physics explanation is when the sun dips below the horizon, the different wavelengths of light get cut off at different points. Mm -hmm. So, like, we see the sun as being this very orange thing. When the orange dips below, then the green can flash momentarily. Ah, that makes sense. Yeah, So, but you have to have, like, no clouds, etc. Right, it has to be perfect yeah. conditions. Be perfect. Be perfect. you got to be in Hawaii or, like, Anguilla or, like, hey, you know. Hey, hey. <laughs> yeah, no, it's cool. It's cool to see. Can you believe that Photoshop is 25 years old and we still know. use it? <laughs> I yeah, use I use it all the time. Before. Yeah. Know, kind of crazy. Here's an article uh, in the New York Times by Farad Manju, who is their tech writer. Took over for David Pogue a year, year and a half, a year and a half ago. Uh, talking about the changes that have occurred uh, with Photoshop in those 25 years. It really, you know, when you think about it, like what software have you been using for 25 years? I don't even use Microsoft Word anymore. Because I use Google Docs, so it's 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 crazy. But he talks about how they shifted from, you know, the shrink wrap software that you bought off the shelf for seven hundred dollars to now the subscription service for ten dollars a month. Right. They had a huge dip in the revenue, uh, calculated dip in the revenue when they transitioned people off of that thing. But now they're basically back up to, I think it was three billion dollars a year, approaching three and a half billion dollars a year. Um, but they're finding that in the Instagram world, people really just want kind of that filter button. And, and so they're slicing and dicing uh, Photoshop into different components and apps. Yeah. Do, to, are you to subscribed to the Creative Cloud? I do. I do. 
Nice, yeah. We are here at the office. And yeah, yeah they, they have more than 3 million subscribers now to the cloud. It's unbelievable. Since 2013. Yeah, yeah, it is. But it made a lot of loyalists, you know, mad because they're like, I bought this software for $700 and now you're... <laughs> Which I totally understand. Yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. On the flip side, I got to say, you know, when they're updating features and you don't have to do anything, I mean, that... that it's sort of like your phone. It's like the updates come in and right. you're happy that you don't have to maintain uh, the computer. Because I remember installing and reinstalling and trying to find the serial numbers. You know, I, I, I always actually bought my copy of Photoshop. So it was legit, but Same. it was a ginormous yeah. pain in the butt. Yeah. I know. Anyway. I think I have an old version on my personal computer. I should yeah. just update to the cloud. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> $10, it's like one drink in Manhattan. Yeah, really. <laughs> oh, Lots of tributes going on for the Photoshop 25th anniversary. Kind of like SNL 40 if you're into that. <laughs> <laughs> I like that comparison. Um, speaking of Photoshop, I don't even know what this is, to be honest. Sea, uh, yeah. sea Salt and Company, they're a little firm in Florida, I believe, came out with a Photoshop actions collection called The Hanging Tree. Um, and as you can see from this graphic, uh, the, the cover shot is a noose hanging from a tree in this very, like, dark, noirish um, image. As you can imagine, this elicited a lot of reaction through social media. People were like, what the hell are you guys doing? What are you thinking? <laughs> and then Sea Salt came back and said, we're not saying anything. We just, this, you know... Throughout history, lots of people have been hung from trees. <laughs> because most of the criticism was, this is a, this is a black thing. Right. And they're saying, no, 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 no. Throughout history, a lot of people have been hung. What are you talking about? Look, you can't project your, and I'm paraphrasing now, you can't project your biases on something that's sort of neutral. This goes back and forth, back and forth. Like hundreds of stuff, and sea salt keeps coming back in and defending themselves. Terrible and then, PR they, tactic. Terrible. 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 And finally, I think they deleted the post or something. Thank God. But this is just... You know what this is? This <laughs> is uh, just being really tone deaf. Yeah. Given all of the racial strife that's been going on, Ferguson, Eric Gardner, you know, we, we keep seeing new video being released. There was one I saw yesterday in St. Louis, 18-year-old being beaten, and then you hear the cop saying, uh, oh, wait. Hold on, let me go turn the camera off. <laughs> it's like oh you can't God. you can't pretend that this stuff isn't going on and that you're somehow neutralized from any of the the tension that's going on. So this to me, I mean, I understand where they're coming from from a completely academic standpoint, but it's such a tone deaf PR perspective. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it just shows a real lack of knowledge for any kind of American history or sensitivity to sensitivity to the country's history like uh and also they're yeah, they should have just apologized, taken it down. And I'm not sure why in the first place they would want their brand associated with a negative image just like this in general. Yeah, it's weird because it's not it's not edgy in the way that you're like, oh that's tough. You know, okay. it's not like NWA. It's just like yeah, it's like no. people in Florida trying to be edgy, and you're like, oh, come on, man. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I don't even know what these actions do, and I don't, you know what? I don't really, I don't really care. I don't care. I don't care. Your ads are racist and weird. <laughs> you know what's coming soon? I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> are you talking about spring or the return of Mad Men? Both. Ah. <laughs> uh, Hollywood photographer uh, who's done a lot of work for um, movie posters as well as years and years of Mad Men, Frank Ockenfels, the third, uh, has photos from the final season, I guess we could call it a half season, of the AMC hit show Mad Men, which I love. Yeah, amazing. And, show. you know, I have to say, it must be so fun to work on a period piece. Especially that's like 60s, that had all this, this crazy cloth, clothing and design sensibility. Um, 
And I just thought, you know, you found these photos, and I, I just think they're lovely. Yeah, and I mean, and it must be so fun also just to work on a set, to be a set photographer. I mean, you've got an amazing cast right in front of you that knows how to work it for the camera. Mm -hmm. The lights are already set up for you. You know, it's like everyone's just hamming it up. I love it. Pun intended. I, I love it. <laughs> and, and, you know, the, the outfit that uh, Megan on the right there is wearing is just... That is absurd. <laughs> so absurdly fantastic. <laughs> she's wearing, it like, a two-piece yeah. white she's lace. She's rocking it. Mm -hmm. She's rocking it. She's rocking it. April Good. 5th is when it comes back. April 5th. Can't come soon enough. No. Uh, Wired Magazine uh, has their annual sex issue right now. I didn't really know that that was a thing. Um, but they published a set of images um, by, I think, the Polish photographer. I'm going to guess by the name, but I could be totally wrong. Uh, Masik Jacek. And I'm sure I butchered that name as well. <laughs> and, kind of, well, first of all, I kind of like the... I kind of like the, 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 the contrast that these images have compared to what you traditionally think of as nude photography or art nude photography. There's, there's something non-obvious about it. I mean, there's right. obviousness. I mean, they're obviously nude, and you obviously can tell bodies. But there's something kind of cool about what's going on here. Yeah, he's got this foggy color kind of just smeared over the over the subject. It makes for a really beautiful and kind of graceful look at the body. Um, and it really, you know, this blend of color reminded me of the Brooklyn-based photographer Carlos van der Rohe, who has a portrait series. He, he did a couple that had a variation, but he found like some weird machine that like read your aura or something like that and took a bunch of portraits with that. We'll put the link up on the... Uh, Oh, on yes. Blog. Yes, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, but it was the same sort of visual effect in terms of the color, this hypersaturated color being blended into a, a different color. But that was um, just face portraits. That correct? was just faces, yeah. Okay, yeah. But super similar, and, and Carlos uh, started doing that, I think, in 2009. So I don't know if this is homage or whether they just kind of happened, um, but, but I like the effect. There's something very sort of contemporary about the look of this. Anyway, if you want to know more about Wired Sex, it's on the Wired website, wired.com. <laughs> you know, New York and Boston have a love-hate relationship, oh, mostly in jest. You know, the New York teams, particularly the, the Yankees and the Red Sox, or the Celtics and the Knicks, and just kind of general, in general, you know, New York people... <laughs> Stereotypically, we, uh, we hate we hate Boston people. I will say, man, thank God we live in New York right now and not Boston. Because Boston, holy bananas. They, <laughs> they've oh, had bananas. about 100 inches of snow. 100 inches of snow. I can't even imagine how much snow. They have so much snow, they don't even know where to put it, literally. They are oh. piling it up in uh, parking lots and empty spaces. They can't even dump all of it in the oceans because the snow is filled with uh, pollution and salt, which would damage a lot of the sea life. Right. So they're just piling this stuff up. We've seen people, you know, jumping out of their windows into the snow and the mayor had to say, <laughs> don't be an idiot, don't do that. Yesterday he came out with that. <laughs> but look on the Boston Globes, the big picture at how much snow there is. Up to people's roofs. Oh my roofs. God. roofs. <laughs> yep, the roof. The roof. It's <laughs> insane. It's insane. There are like, uh, I think it was at MIT, they had piled up the snow so high they were calling it like Mount Cambridge something <laughs> or another. Um, but, you know, I was thinking about going up to uh, Boston uh, in a next weekend, and uh, Lucy, one of the programmers, uh, from our office is going up to Boston. I think she left yesterday. And the first thing I asked her was, you have all-wheel drive on your car? She's like, yeah, we have a Jeep. Mm. You're going to need it because a normal car cannot get through this. stuff. Like, you, Let's say you find somewhere to park and then it snows another six inches and then it melts and then you can't, you can't get your car out. <laughs> I am so glad 
I don't live in Boston anymore. See? <laughs> don't have to deal See? with this. I'm so, I said, I'm sending love to all my friends in Boston. Oh gosh. That's right. Sarah went to Emerson, so she's familiar with uh, yeah. Boston. But it never snowed like that when you were there. No, thank God, no. Whew. Well, <laughs> the Boston Globe, being in Boston, has this nice uh, big picture story. But there's ton of, tons of photos from uh, the Northeast getting nailed with hundreds. A uh, hundred inches of snow. Spring cannot come soon enough. We always like to end on a fun, happy note uh, for dog lovers out there. You might know that the Westminster Kennel Club Dog Show happened this past week. The New York Times sent their photographer Fred Conrad to the show. He always goes out and he shoots, and uh, he um, photographed. Dogs, portraits of the dogs, and then portraits of owners, and then they put a little pop quiz together. Because, you know, there's this whole notion that people look like their pets. <laughs> um, and so they put a little quiz together to see if you could match the dog to the owner. This was fun to take. It was really fun. How'd you do? I only got three correct <laughs> <laughs> out of 12. <laughs> I, I got four out of 12. Nice. Uh, okay. But, you know... You know what's funny? You go through uh, any sort of test like this, and when you nail it, you think, oh, man, I'm, I'm so smart. That was so <laughs> obvious to me. And then when you don't nail it, my, my first instinct was, you know what? I knew, I knew that was the person. That right, was, right. That was, I kind of was about to click that, but then I changed my mind in the second right. one. Right. So, I've, I've never done like a picture quiz like this online, and I'm, I'm happy they made this little interactive thing. It kind of made me... It just made me interact with the photos more and actually look at them longer. But it also yeah, made myself yeah. worse. You know I was like, oh, I got them all wrong. I Damn. think they made this first one super obvious. Oh, yeah. Look at this dog and then look at the woman's hair. <laughs> I love same it. Same color. It's kind of the same sort of spiky style. So you get the first one right and you're like, oh, man, this is so easy. Yeah. I, am, I am so good at this. <laughs> and then you do the rest and you're like, oh, not even close. Not even close. But a lovely set of uh, photos. And to your point, like a great use of sort of interactivity with photography to make it fun for everyone. Yeah. Fun for everyone. Take that quiz. That, that link, uh, uh, as well as all these other ones, will be on our blog at uh, blog.photoshelter.com. Sarah, today it's supposed to go down to 4 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh, no. Parts of the Hudson River are frozen. <laughs> um, most of Lake Erie, I read this yesterday, 94% of Lake Erie, one of the Great Lakes, is frozen. Wow. Well, I, I, what, what is going on? I don't what know, but going on? I'm just going to stay inside. Stay inside. Watch, you know, <laughs> fire up that Netflix queue. Yep. <laughs> stay inside. There's nothing to take photos of. Well, actually, I was going to walk over to the uh, river and maybe take some photos of ice. Oh, uh, I know. And I've got to shoot tomorrow, so ugh, I guess I do have to get out of the house. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is it. Uh, hopefully, you guys liked the show today. Um, watch the video on youtube.com slash photoshelter. Get all the links on blog.photoshelter.com or maybe just download the podcast by searching for I Love Photography on iTunes. Thanks for joining us. We will see you next week. Bye-bye.